your telephone, please call the phone. Як змінився жанр інтерв'ю із появою нових медіа майданчиків? How has interview changed with the new media platforms? What do they tell, talk about Ukraine and the United States? Why is preparation for interview sometimes more difficult than a conversation as such? This is what we're going to talk about at the America House. I'm Tatiana Strelchenko, I'm director of the America House in Kiev, and today we have well-known cultural uh, actors in Ukraine, and the subject of this online event is in-depth talk culture, interview as the art of finding common ground, and I'm giving the floor to Cynthia Nichols from the U.S. Embassy, who runs the programs of America House in Ukraine. I'm Cynthia. Independent media plays a, an essential role in a democratic society society. Media creates dialogue, allows people to question what they know and create open communication. Their power and impact are undeniable. Without independent media, society falters. A key part of media is communication and language, both powerful tools that play an essential role in society and create mutual understanding and help us learn. Last week, people all over Ukraine and the world united for the 21st all-Ukrainian radio dictation of national unity. People of different ages and professions joined together to write and tell stories of Ukraine, proving once again that the Ukrainian language is not only a unique national treasure, but a language that unites generations of Ukrainians worldwide. Tonight, you will hear from some of the brightest minds of Ukraine, prominent Ukrainian writers, heads of international institutions and founders of independent media, all people who share Ukraine's stories with the world. They will give us insight on how media 
and communication can build cultural bridges. We'll learn how their own experiences establish strong cultural ties and find common ground between countries and nations. Their work creates a powerful message about Ukraine, and when, and when they speak, the world listens. Thank you to our guests for being here, and a hearty thank you to all of you who are joining us online tonight. Sharing our culture and creating mutual understanding through language is why we're here. We salute everyone here for promoting some of the greatest minds in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, Tizia, for those words. We're getting back to our studios. We have invited well-known Ukrainian culture actors, bloggers, leaders of public opinion, and we have the honor of organizing this together with Craft Magazine, who are our partners with for this event. Who are we going to have with us? Katerina Kazimira, founder of Craft Magazine, executive director of Art Web Digital Agency. Kate Surkan, writer, editor, and translator, co-founder of the Apophany Media Platform. Tatiana Tarrant, journalist, curator of book projects, literary programs, executive director of PAN Ukraine. Andrei Kurkov, writer, journalist, screenwriter, president of PAN Ukraine. Serhii Jadon, writer, translator, musician, screenwriter, public figure. Nina Karno, professor of the Ohio State University, United States, founder of the YouTube channel, Nina Ukraine. Unfortunately, not all the guests have been able to join us offline. Some of them will join us online. But let's start with the first question that I have to Katerina. You have founded MediaCraft during the pandemic times. Maybe you can tell us more about this project, how all that took place. Why is this a mono genre project? Because that's what you chose. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. It's true that we have this idea of founding this media even during the first lockdown that started when the quarantine started. And then it became, became a real project at the time of the second lockdown late last year. And probably this was not accidental because I believe that, not all, I believe that at the times of such global challenges, we can see the most valuable, most important things, and culture becomes a priority. We all are look for those new ways toward creativity and arts and uh, creating crafts. And creating craft has always been an impetus, you know, for artists. The genre of interview was not accidentally chosen by us, although we all understand that to start for a new young media, whether a regional one or a cultural one or a national one, the most important thing is to reach some kind of uh, uh, proper level. You need to have traffic. And to do that, you need to update your content every day to make it versatile, to have news content, articles, top 10, top 100 lists, and choosing just one genre was and uh, still is quite a courageous step. But we decided that if we move away from mono genre, it would be, it would move away our focus and our main objective. And our main objective has been and will be, I hope, is to open up the personalities of the artists of Ukrainian artists through conversations. And this one clean, active and live and dynamic genre can do that. As to the subject matter, and uh, here, of course, we are for diversity. We have just one genre about the areas uh, we try to cover as many of them, but of course, one may start questioning us and asking why we started with writers. Well, this is true. First of all, it was easier for us because at the very beginning, we, with my partner, who is a historian and theoretician of literature, it was easier for us to do it that way. And besides, the team of the authors who have joined us at the very beginning, they also worked uh, in the area of literature. Most of them were literary critics and it was easier for us to start 
than that way. However, now we can already see it our pages, and I encourage all of you to uh, read us. We can see other categories like theater, like painting, cinema, ballet. We will try to keep doing that. Talking about the specificity, well, of course, the interview genre, we did not invent it. We did not do anything innovative. However, the roles that we have in our interviews and how the conversation is built between all the participants of those interviews. The professional nature is the very first principle. All of our authors are experts in this area in which their heroes, the characters, the interviewees work. And this allows our final publications to be interesting for our professional community. Then, now, this respect in the conversation, this is the basis, the eagerness to listen and to hear each other. I'm talking about the interviewee and the interviewer and uh, looking for common values and all that makes our circle of readers broader than just the professional community. The conversations are broader, they're more honest about the most important things. That's why they're close to broad audiences. And with every month, it becomes more and more broad geographically and uh, in terms of age groups. Eventually, what is the most important thing, perhaps, is the uh, artistic final nature, fineness of all of our texts. When, when you come to the last line in the interview, you should feel the joy of having found something new and something interesting. We're all looking for new senses. And I believe that our materials really provide some answers to important questions, existential questions. And of course, we also have an English version. All of our materials are translated into English. All the journalists and authors who study the genre of interviews, they remember that golden triangle rule of the interview as a genre. Who is the interviewer who is invited as interviewee? But the third angle is also very important. Who is it for? Who is your audience? Well, talking about the demographic indicators who are people in our audience. These are people between 35 and 44. That's the biggest group. Uh, what comes second is the group between 24 and 25 and 44. And uh, this uh, latest slot has been growing in the past three months. As regards the territories, we can show you our infographics, the territories where they read us. Well, of course, Ukraine is our priority region. Almost 65% of our readers come from Ukraine. And I can't say that this they're only in the Ukrainian language there, they find they read us in 20% uh, of Ukrainian readers read us in English. The United States comes second, Germany, Poland come uh, third and fourth, and then uh, with three and less percent. But basically these are 94 countries where people have read our materials at least once, and they have read them, not just visited the website, because we try to track whether they read all of our publications till the very end. Well, abroad they would read your Ukrainian version, yes, as well as the English and the Russian one. We have Tetyana with us today who has very, huge experience in interviews. You have five books you've published. Maybe you can tell us about your experience, what you work on now, and what kind of uh, projects are the most important for you. Good evening. I'm honored and happy to participate in this conversation since everybody who is working in this area for many years, they uh, didn't really have a um, didn't really have any chance to tell them more about this uh, type of work, about its nature. If it is a book interview, 
we tend to speak about the characters more than anything else. And uh, it is a really unique opportunity to discuss about the genre per se, and the need to talk about that is really high. And having received uh, the invitation from Kraft, and uh, I really respect your magazine, and I'm your regular reader, and uh, I do ad admire the fact that uh, journalism in Ukraine finally has this type of media outlet. When I was a student, I was dreaming of having something like that. Uh, we've never had anything like that in Ukraine before. And uh, when I was reading about this uh, as the fact in other countries, I was jealous of it. Uh, the quality of the of the materials, the quality of uh, um, visuals, of photos, that's uh, a huge success for uh, our journalism. A couple of days ago, I just um, read the e interview with uh, director Svetlana Oleshka. That's a very needed and uh, uh, long-awaited type of work, uh, and uh, especially those who have been kind of, you know, aspiring for that uh, for a while in Ukrainian uh, culture. Getting back to your question. Uh, I uh, used to have several projects running in parallel, but uh, more uh, like a manager. And uh, I realized that some point that uh, I didn't have any time and uh, and actually opportunity to uh, play with different genres. And I decided to uh, stop on one that would be the closest to me. And uh, I uh, picked up a book interview um, as a genre and uh, I started uh, focusing on that in 2013. It was the type of journalism that was pre-Maidan type of events. Uh, well, that was a kind of a turning point uh, since uh, later we saw a lot of new different uh, um, outlets appear in Ukrainian reporters, craft, for instance. But in 2013, we didn't have any outlets like that. Uh, and uh, professionally, it was difficult for me to realize that uh, uh, we are losing a lot of really reputable people in our culture. And well, these people are gone and very often, um, they uh, um, remain unheard. Uh, uh, it was uh, Pokalchuk and other important names that uh, um, were gone. And every time this happened, I had this feeling that uh, in the very first days, months or years, we need to go back to this person and hear the voice of the person in literature and culture. And there was no opportunity to, to, to do that. And that's... Uh, uh, that's why I uh, recall this interview of Timbiska Barbara, because uh, I think that we'll go back and back to this uh, piece of work uh, to get uh, these ideas uh, again and to hear their voices. So the original idea was the idea of a TV project. Unfortunately, it wasn't uh, supported because interviews is not really the one that is popular and uh, gets higher ranking. And uh, um, if you talk about interviews with uh, people of art, uh, well, it's not really popular. So then um, I thought, okay, so if that's the case, then I'll try to do it on my own. And um, I wanted to create an archive. I wanted to find some time and uh, record uh, the interviews uh, with writers, and that would uh, turn into archive project. The first character was Anatoly Dumarov. He was uh, 92 then. That was the anthology of uh, writers' voices. So we have three volumes uh, completed now. And my duty is to finish the entire project and uh, do the fourth volume uh, that's planned to be completed next year. And then we'll have 42 voices of Ukrainian writers in this archive. So the idea of archive was the first one, but having talked to uh, Mr. Demarov, I started working with the text and we talked for more than four hours. And uh, then I uh, um, got the idea of the structure of the uh, themes and the format that we could work with. And Anatoly sort of blessed this project. 
and uh, that's a long lasting story uh, this project i mean um, that was started in 2013 it's me and uh, photographer Alexander Homenko who are working on that. Uh, we recorded video materials as well, but I tend to work with this uh, as if it were a book. So we'll talk about newspaper type of interview, online type of interview, TV, radio interview, but there is also a book interview. And that's a different type of a genre. And if you uh, work in this format, you keep a book in mind and uh, you are focused on the structure as well. In my previous uh, project uh, that was book interview with uh, Taras Prohasko, it was uh, it was one character and it was a book uh, interview, the interview that lasted for a while, it lasted for the whole week, and you had to be really focused on the structure, on the composition, and there should be a story there, you know, so the just the uh, intro opening and uh, culmination and uh, development of the story. So that was a different uh, type of work. There was another interview with Ada Rogovtseva, different theme, a different format, but uh, uh, it's great that we have uh, more and more book interviews. The genre that is called uh, Riva, uh, just following the example of Polish journalism, is becoming something habitual for us. Uh, and uh, uh, it seems to me that Craft uh, uh, um, will tend to develop book interviews as the next stage of its development. Thank you, Tatiana, and uh, uh, the best to you with the project. Did anything change for you in uh, the interview uh, just because of pandemic or nothing has changed? I'm not sure that uh, um, COVID-19 pandemic did have an impact on the interview. Um, I have a feeling that we see more and more interview type of projects. We have a very good tradition. Every Saturday, we um, send uh, uh, emails to uh, pen club members. That's the compilation of the most interesting things that uh, cropped up in Ukrainian and uh, foreign media outlets. And that's a set of interviews that uh, is included there with uh, people of art. And uh, fortunately, we have Ukrainian media outlets that uh, keep working with interview and interviewing people of art. We have radio projects. We have lots of uh, podcasts. That's a new uh, trend in audio interview. I can say that uh, we are lacking interviews, but if you talk about uh, interviews with intellectuals, uh, I wouldn't say that uh, we see more of them. And uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, due to COVID-19 pandemic, we have the increased demand for a more complex, uh, um, seems to be talked about uh, um, for novels, uh, kind of thicker books, because everybody has more time. There are lots of uh, open type of questions that everybody's concerned about. And uh, uh, so that's something that uh, could be more popular in complex transitional times. Um, well, it's very important that uh, it is one of the priorities, at least for Ukrainian market. Uh, we have uh, uh, another project in our pen club where we try to invite guest speakers uh, to discuss uh, uh, pertinent issues. And in the course of uh, quarantine, it wasn't just online discussions, but also online interviews that we've organized. We uh, have been uh, also cooperating with uh, some media outlets and a couple of months ago, we launched uh, uh, Miroslav Barchuk's uh, um, interview project called Space, uh, whereby we would uh, make the voices of intellectuals visible. So these are long, in-depth conversations that uh, would part of uh, would become part of the uh, Ukrainian media landscape. So. I don't believe that we have sufficient uh, uh, amount of them in the Ukrainian landscape. It seems uh, to me that young people are more keen on Instagram type of uh, um, interviews. If that's a young 
person who is uh, um, starting working in this area, what would you recommend them to do? It seems to me that there are two angles here. If you talk about the demand uh, on the part of young people, I'm not sure they would be interested in long, complex type of interviews. I don't have the feeling they do have it. If you talk about the influence of social media, uh, new uh, formats uh, with uh, TikToks and uh, brief uh, interviews, clip uh, type of uh, thinking that we see typical of today. I'm not sure that uh, um, that would uh, match long and complex uh, interviews. So I'm not sure young people uh, would be interested in long conversations. Um, if you talk about craft and the audience uh, that supports craft and loves craft, so these are the people that uh, value long in-depth conversation with the intellectuals. And if you talk about 15 plus, uh, um, type of young people. I'm not sure that uh, would be the content that they would be looking for. That might be an issue, but on the other hand, we just need to uh, take into consideration all these specificities and every genre has its own target audience. Though I do believe that uh, an interview would be really useful seeing to be included in the training courses at schools, uh, universities, and uh, it's important to promote that uh, is uh, famous uh, people, celebrities, uh, and uh, it's uh, very good that it is a professional who conducts the interview, but if it is an interview of Jadan or Andrehovic, then it's not just uh, an interview um, of a very well-known and loved person, but uh, that's something that would attract uh, younger people as well. Uh, so if uh, there is a prospect of having a conversation of a, a musician, with a musician, sorry, then that would be of interest for young people as well. How to start this path of becoming a professional in uh, taking interviews? I want to make sure that uh, interview wouldn't develop in a chaotic manner. Um, I've uh, often seen that people tend to believe that interview is a simple thing. What you need to do is just uh, uh, make a list of questions. So you ask these questions, then get answers and get it uh, written down. And that's it. But it's not uh, the way it happens. So we want the interview to be developed not only practically, but theoretically as well. If you wish, interview has its own rules that require some specific uh, skills um, and uh, you need to learn the experience of those who know how to do that. So I would like to see more opportunities to discuss the theoretical part of it, if, if you wish. If you look at the books that I know, or let's say Mustafa Nayem, the rules of an interview, and uh, that's a very good book because he is knowledgeable and experienced in this genre. Before he became a politician, he uh, accumulated a very good experience in interviewing. And he is one of the best uh, in this area. And we are missing publications like this. And uh, uh, whoever was uh, kind of, you know, uh, establishing this genre in Ukraine, I wish all of them took more to those who are just starting, who are just beginners. But that's uh, more the task for educational institutions. Uh, School of Journalism is doing uh, a lot uh, in this regard, uh, the same uh, about Kiev Mohila Academy, but uh, I'm not sure the tools uh, available to them are sufficient. We also have the uh, award, uh, Georgi Gangadze Award, that includes this set of issues as well. And for two years in a row, we organize video lectures of uh, reputable journalists who uh, 
tell about uh, interview um, as well in their lectures. But I would like to see more books, more lectures uh, um, to disclose the details of interviewed more and courses at the educational institutions that would be um, trained jointly with the practitioners, with professionals. That would be the best scenario for the students. Then there are skills, rules uh, that should be mastered. Uh, but, uh, well, yeah, here we talk about prep stage, about the interview itself and uh, the work with the text, video or audio materials. And that's a long conversation. That's the conversation for a, a different meeting. We have Kate Surkhan, she's American who studies uh, modern Ukrainian literature professional. Kate, are you with us? Can you hear us? I can hear you. Hello. Well, hello from America House. My question is, what makes modern Ukrainian literature unique? What do you think, you as the person who was born in another cultural context? Uh, well, there's many things that makes uh, modern Ukrainian literature unique. We can really see that it is uh, developing in real time, uh, that uh, writers are really a part of everyday conversation because of the situation with war. Unfortunately, literature is not so removed from politics at this time. Uh, you see, for example, uh, Andrei Lupka's book Carbide, which was just released in English this year, reflecting uh, the nature of Maidan, uh, the nature uh, of Ukrainian spirit before Bazviz, where the main character wanted to, uh, you know, uh, smuggle all of Ukrainians into Europe under this tunnel. So uh, it's very interesting that uh, a lot of foreigners can learn about Ukraine, uh, Ukraine through Ukrainian literature, but also be really impressed by the talent of the writers and their creativity. They are not lecturing. Uh, they are uh, very playful at times. And I think that it's a great form of cultural diplomacy that not every uh, world, um, uh, not every country has when it comes to its literature. Thank you very much. And in fact, how do foreigners, uh, what do they think about the modern Ukrainian literature? What's the feedback that you get? Uh, so on Epiphany, it's very interesting. We have seen that uh, people from all over the world are reading uh, the Ukrainian authors that we have published. When you see someone in uh, Cambodia or China has read a story by uh, Yuri Andruhovich, uh, it's, it's a very pleasing thing to see uh, that readers are engaging and that uh, perceived cultural differences do not stop them from enjoying this literature. Uh, what I think has been the most interesting thing for uh, foreign readers is to understand uh, the mentality of Ukrainian writers. And this has been thanks to interviews that we have published. Uh, when Epophany was started uh, four years ago now, we published only short stories, uh, uh, poetry and uh, nonfiction. But uh, the problem with the English language market is that uh, only about 3% of books are translations. Now, if you consider this small number, imagine how few are Ukrainian books as compared to Spanish or French, which really dominate the translation market. Uh, and interviews really allowed uh, readers to get more into the mind. Of, uh, of these Ukrainian writers. And uh, this is especially important for writers who are not yet widely translated into English. Uh, for example, we published an interview with Artem Chupai, uh, who uh, those who follow him on social media see that he's gotten into photography recently. And uh, we did an interview about his passion for photography, uh, how it relates to his work as a writer, how they complement each other, and uh, also about uh, his travels through uh, America. And uh, a lot of readers really uh, have, have sent good feedback that they enjoy these interviews. It makes them excited to read authors, uh, authors' work, that they are waiting for these translations. And most importantly, that uh, a lot of these translations that we've published feel like um, 
sit down conversations, like they're eavesdropping on a conversation between two friends over a glass of wine. Mm -hmm. So this is the most important thing that our readers uh, feel that Ukrainian literature is accessible, that Ukrainian authors are not so different from American or French writers, that they are driven by uh, very common themes, passions, and uh, they are excited and they're always waiting to discover uh, someone new. Thank you very much, Kate, and thank you for having joined us online today. Working back to our studios, today we have a person who need not be introduced, Andrei Kurkov, president of Penn Ukraine, a well-known Ukrainian writer. I think you have been most, the, the Ukrainian writer who has had most translations into English, 12 books, right? You've just come back from the US. What is your experience? What was your project there? Well, I was a visiting sculptor on Fulbright, program in California, University in San Diego. Unfortunately, the university was closed because of the pandemic. So my conversation with the colleagues was most over Zoom, although we had some eye to eye meetings with some of them. I delivered some lectures and the subject of my project was the history of evolution of knowledge about Ukraine in America, starting with 1991. What has changed? And what was its evolution of this knowledge? Well, I cannot say that my conclusion is very optimistic because competing for Ukraine with other countries at the market of knowledge about a certain country in America, it is very difficult. However, it was interesting to talk. And of course, most people I talked to were American intellectuals, academics, business people, politicians, and for this community, well, they know Ukraine. However, as one of my friends said, Americans, common Americans are more interested in the countries where they send their troops. From that point of view, we are short of American troops here. Then of course, uh, there would be more knowledge in America about us. But in any case, if we compare us to France, well, they know France because of gastronomy, culture, history, geography. Uh, there's a huge cultural influence. And of course, the influence of French settlers, including General Lafayette and others, who Americans know. We were not lucky enough because they know about us via political news. Our culture cannot yet draw their attention so much, the attention of the general audience, so that our culture could compete with political news. And that's why when I talked to common people, those of them who knew Ukraine, they remember the telephone conversation between Trump and President Zelensky. There was nothing else that they could remember. Well, I was quite uh, happily surprised that nobody remembered Oliver Stone's film or other films that uh, are produced by, say, Ihor Lopationok, living in Los Angeles, who specializes in pseudo-documentary films about Ukraine. But uh, it's good to sell news when it's bad news. That's why good news does not really become news, well, news about Ukraine. Well, at least for now, I hope this can change. But there is a certain things that you have brought up here. I think it's very important. Americans love interviews. In America, the genre of biographical novel and autobiographies is very important. And in very many libraries and bookshops, there would be a separate book stand with just faces on the books. It looks like people who have written about themselves, such autobiographies. You would find Hillary Clinton, Colin Powell there. There is a separate market for biographies about George Washington or Lincoln or Franklin. And in that respect, I think that as soon as we can find a Ukrainian person who Americans like, whether a living one or a dead one, uh, 
I'm sure some American publishers would want to have a biographic book or an autobiography or a biographical novel, and then it will start. Because Americans, they basically love, you know, people they can talk to. Well, not only if they're alive, even if they're historic, historical characters, but they become alive when you read about them. And I think that this interest should be used and it should be understood as well. And uh, now the fact that this genre is becoming more popular here, I think that would give a very good push toward a situation where the genre of Ukrainian interviews could become interesting for foreign publishers and foreign magazines and newspapers. Because I, I watch a lot of interviews on YouTube with foreign writers, with people who are interesting for me. And I, of course, read their interviews in foreign media. Well, if you interviewed some outstanding Americans, whether living or dead, who would that be? Who would you like to interview? Well, I may do it one day. I would very much like to talk for two or three hours with Paul Austin. Now talking about, well, with Kerouac, but, you know, these are almost, well, Kerouac, Hemingway, these are intellectual pop figures. Who interests me is Tom Waits. And I have recently watched uh, a, a movie, Nomadland, of the uh, American Chinese film director. It's a uh, feature movie that is made in fact, you know, following a documentary, a document, well, the life that is like a document where you have real people who play themselves and actors as well. It would be very interesting for me to talk to her, to the film director and to the people who played themselves in that movie. Well, it's interesting. I know that you have a huge experience in being interviewed, you have given very many interviews. What was the experience of your interview for a craft magazine? Well, you know, that was too comfortable. For me, well, I have this experience of uh, public interviews and uh, a person, including myself, when we moderate, you know, we're talking to writers. So such public interviews, well, this interview was somewhat similar to what I had with Kraft. If I compare it, once I was, I think it was 2014, 2015, I was invited to BBC Hard Talk. There you feel like you are sitting in a fire. And that's a very different genre. You are just always ready for a stress. Well, here you are ready for tea and they give you coffee. But it was interesting, basically, because when this conversation is not very hasty, when it is about very different things and when it smoothly proceeds from one plane into another, you forget that this is an interview, in fact. You become more open, more honest and uh, this self-censure disappears when you do not want to say something going too far away well i've just remember i once moderated i moderated many meetings in india with writers from different countries including from the us and i remember that i played a little bit there i was very slow in asking my questions about the wine that they like about their childhood. And then I asked them about whether they remember who, what was the first book that they stole at the library for the first time. If I had started with that, the conversation would not have gone on. But after I asked them about the easy things, it turned out to be very easy for them to talk about stolen books as well. Well, we have talked about advice for the young people who are starting to work with interviews. So opening up uh, the audience in an emotional way is possible with such easy questions, right? And then ask a provocative question. What do you think, Andre? Can interview as a genre form a public opinion? Well, first of all, it uh, forms the elite. Because if I'm interested in any new Ukrainian character, 
at the stage, intellectual stage or artistic stage, I would look for a most profound interview with that person, if, if any. And through this interview, especially if this is a video interview, then I would better understand this person and what's capacity and potential and understand uh, how the level of the interview correlate to the intellectual level of the interviewee because it's very important to find this harmony one cannot ask two simple questions to a person who is not too simple and who is interested in complicated things so basically i believe that for the ukrainian society that is permanently changing that is being formed now where it, that only has a historic base there is no new Ukrainian foundations, intellectual foundations after 1991. Well, it is there, but it's still uh, based on the Ukrainian base, on the historical basis. And the characters of Ukrainian history, the old history and not too old history, especially the 20th century, very often they're more interesting for us rather than uh, our colleagues in our today's life. After this, uh, I feel responsible and I should ask you a very difficult question. And here is the question. What would be the question that you would like to answer, but you've never asked this question before? You've never been asked it before. At least it was a little bit difficult. If you did ask this question, I would say, well, that's the one. I have never been asked anything like that. But, uh, you know, it seems to me there is a question like that. And there could be more than one, but, um, okay, nobody ever asks about the level of knowledge of modern Ukrainians about the Soviet uh, period uh, of Ukrainian history. And that's why nobody speaks about the influence of uh, Soviet history over Ukrainian mentality and uh, over the scenes happening in Ukraine now. Because it seems to me that uh, the root causes uh, uh, for the issues we are facing today could be found uh, in uh, the way they were resolved then or the way they were resolved by persons with the Soviet mentality or when we look at the situations that happen under different circumstances or in different countries. Thank you very much, Andre. We have a, a guest from the US, that's Nina Karnauch. She is uh, telling Americans about modern Ukraine and uh, she's telling Ukrainians about modern Americans. Can you hear us? Yes, I do. We're happy to see you. So the question to you, we know about your project Nina Ukraine. Uh, how did you come up with this idea? How, how and why did you pick up this type of format? And do you believe that interview is, is a kind of a living instrument uh, that uh, uh, is uh, to become popular. Andrei Kurkov, uh, Kurkov said that uh, if you start talking uh, with a person uh, with discussing wines, that uh, would make the person comfortable. So when I was listening to that, uh, I got an idea that when you listen to the music with somebody jointly, then uh, the person might feel uh, more comfortable and then you start asking more difficult questions. The idea of the format that I have, well, you know, uh, my... Um, American friends uh, like the Ukrainian songs and I like to, to show Ukrainian songs and uh, dances and I did that offline uh, for many years. I've been living um, abroad for 10 years and uh, 18 months ago I um, got an idea why don't I have uh, it uh, on the uh, channel. Uh, we started jointly with my American boyfriend and then um, we um, uh, broke up and I started doing that with my friends and strangers. My uh, target audience is uh, Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainians who um, have never been to the US, they don't have many uh, foreign friends and one of the advantages of my channel is uh, 
to give this type of experience to Ukrainians because, well, it's based on my experience, my personal experience that broadened my uh, horizons and uh, allowed to take a little, a little bit different look at myself and uh, realize the value and uniqueness of Ukrainian culture. Um, one of the formats that I have on my channel is when I talk to strangers. I ask the basic uh, questions to Americans. What's the capital of Ukraine? What's the population of Ukraine? Five, uh, 20, 40, 60 million people. Was the state language in Ukraine? Um, how old uh, is Kiev? Uh, have you ever uh, heard uh, anything about the war between Russia and Ukraine? So these questions uh, allow me to see what uh, ordinary Americans know about Ukraine. I like to make uh, people uh, feel uncomfortable. So that makes people step uh, outside their comfort zone and uh, reveal their hidden wishes. Uh, and I honestly show everything that is uh, happening. I don't add it to my interviews. Uh, sometimes uh, people say Ukraine is somewhere between China and Italy. Well, in a way it is. Uh, or they uh, can say that's part of Russia, but maybe that's part of uh, Yugoslavia. I got answers like that too. I mean, Sometimes I get answers that uh, there is less than one million people living in Ukraine. Unfortunately, world history is not very well taught in the U.S., and there are people that uh, show little interest to what is uh, happening outside the U.S. Uh, in Europe. But there are people who are really keen on history, world history, and everything that is happening in Europe and in Ukraine. There are people who have been to Ukraine, and uh, Americans without Ukrainian roots even studied Ukrainian, and this type of uh, um, interviews with Americans, and I uh, had interviews with five Americans who studied Ukrainian. is really interesting experience for Ukrainians that could be inspirational for Ukrainians uh, who have some issues with learning Ukrainian and uh, polishing it, because as soon as they see that uh, non-Russian speaking Americans uh, manage to master Ukrainian, so they can easily do that as well. So another thing that I'm trying to do is just I see some kind of a disconnect between Ukrainians uh, uh, living in Ukraine and Ukrainians living abroad, Ukrainian diaspora. Those who lived abroad can uh, bring added value to Ukrainians. I show Ukrainian restaurants, um, dancing groups, uh, um, all those that is av available in the US. And that's interesting for Ukrainians to see pieces of Ukrainian culture overseas. I show this through interviews and responses. I film how Americans come to Ukrainian museum in Chicago and I talk to them there. I, I'm asking them, why are you here? What do you see here? So what is new that you learned here? Or I go to a Ukrainian restaurant and uh, uh, grab uh, an American uh, while they're testing Ukrainian Borsche Vereniki and uh, I interrupt their meal and ask them, okay, so do you like it? Uh, what you didn't like? And these videos are especially liked by uh, my audience because they, they see this in real time. Another mission that I have is uh, to improve uh, the Ukrainian language because uh, when interviewing Americans, uh, I uh, just add subtitles in English. There are foreigners who are very much interested in Ukrainian. They study Ukrainian and they complain that there are uh, not many uh, good uh, materials in English uh, to study Ukrainian uh, language and to learn more about Ukraine. There is another group of people that's Ukrainians born in the US. So they are of Ukrainian roots, but they've never been to Ukraine or they've been there only a couple of times. They are very interested in uh, Ukraine and Ukrainian, but they don't speak Ukrainian well and they prefer uh, doing everything in English uh, to stay updated about everything that is happening in Ukraine. And there is also a personal mission that I pursue. I love Ukrainian in music. I believe that uh, um, it is unfair that it is not that popular internationally. Ukrainian music has huge potential and it can compete with American music. So uh, I would like a Ukrainian artist uh, to be very popular abroad. And to summarize, I don't have any journalistic experience at all. I just um, came into this uh, field intuitively. I am enjoying what I'm doing and that's something that uh, the audience um, likes because I read comments, I read the recommendations and advice of those people who watch me. And um, 
Well, that's the value that I see for many people. I picked up an interview because I love YouTube. I, I like to see the emotions of people. I, I like to uh, make people respond. Uh, and uh, YouTube is uh, developing rapidly. That's uh, the gap that could be filled in. And this uh, niche of intercultural interview was kind of vacant. And it wasn't very difficult. It was very easy for me to fill it in. and. And, uh, get my audience there. So I, I think the Ukrainian speaking YouTube uh, and uh, video format uh, um, has a lot of potential that could be filled in. And uh, for me, it was a challenge. I have never worked with the, um, uh, filming anything. I have never worked with the audience. I had to cope with my own fears and concerns. And that's a chance for me to talk to different people. So because apart from just filming, um, uh, it uh, you know, I talk to people. So uh, if I didn't have a camera in the hand, it wouldn't be really appropriate. Thank you, Nina. Your mission is very complex, but very nice. You make Ukrainian culture popular abroad. Thank you very much about, uh, for that. Uh, we appreciate that. We have a guest uh, from Kharkov, a poet, Serhii Jadan, probably the most well-known uh, poet uh, of today. The person who was interviewed hundreds of times. Can you hear us? Yes, I do. What do you like more, to interview somebody or to be interviewed? I want to interview somebody. I like listening to other people. I uh, like listening to others. We called uh, today's event interviews and art of uh, establishing common ground. Can you say that uh, um, during one of the interviews that you had, you realized something new about yourself or you changed uh, your attitude or position? It wasn't really changing my position. Usually the conversation for me is the opportunity to listen and hear the others and see uh, what the position of the other person I'm talking to is. It seems to me that the interview is becoming popular in Ukraine just because we had this desire to talk, whether that's uh, on the level of personality or on the level of culture. So this uh, has been a mess and we've never had it to let it out. So we are really monologic. We need to explain ourselves. We want to be heard. We do feel that we are unheard. We are unread. We are not unspoken out. And so that's why there is a high demand for monologue. On the one hand, there is a trap about it because a lot of people are ready to speak but are not ready to listen. But if you are ready to listen and can hear people, then there are huge opportunities for you here to get this feel, uh, to get this feel of, of the time, the feel of the, the, the society at large. And that's a really an adventure, enjoyable adventure for me. Last year, I started working at the radio. And uh, so this type of genre of an interview was a revelation to me. That's like a new world to me. That's absolutely incredibly interesting scene for me. You see how the person is opening up or not opening up, the, how the person can find himself themselves or is scared to do so, how the person opens something new about herself or the, all of a sudden the person realizes that there is nothing to, to look for there about the personality of the person. So that's a luxury in a way when you can talk to the most interesting people of your country. How can you open the person out emotionally? Andrea starts this conversation with talking about wine. What about you? Do you have any uh, tips? You know what I asked about wine too. It works. Wine or anything else. Well, you know, very often the person, uh, it could be a public person that was interviewed hundreds of times, the person is kind of opening up when the person uh, realizes that you are genuinely interested in the answers, it, that you are doing not just to tick the box. It's not a formality, but you are genuinely interested in the person and what the person feels. And uh, uh, it's kind of moving, it's touching because everybody wants to be, uh, wants to be 
wants to, to, to be needed, uh, to, to, to be interesting for others. So we sort of lack attention. And uh, very often you don't have uh, to come up with something, you know, out of uh, ordinary. Sometimes people just can talk and it doesn't mean that they are bad people. No, it's just, you know, we are different people. We are different by nature, by the manner of talking, by, uh, uh, by, by the way we we, we talk and can express ourselves. The scene interesting for me is when the person is trying to talk through the scenes that uh, the, this person uh, has never discussed before. Since I often invite people who uh, are popular for interviewers and uh, that's why it makes us especially interesting when the person starts talking about things like that and if you look at the life experience of the person you would realize that what the person is really interested in you can't uh, talk negatively about the uh, area you work in but uh, normally when you talk about our media outlets interviews um, are normally quite uh, superfluous they are never in depth but usually uh, the, the guest you invite uh, is ready to discuss something complex and important but nobody asks about that Another question. Poetry, your poetry is very popular. You uh, had the audience of 500 people, a thousand people attending uh, your sessions. Uh, it's not very typical of the US, at least. Poetry is a monologue in a way. Um, is this related to what you said that there is a high demand for monologue in Ukraine? Is there a demand for poetry? Uh, to some extent, yes, that's a monologue or monologues, uh, and that's an opportunity to get somebody's experience, emotional experience, and try to match it against your experience. Experience. Uh, um, that's uh, an art uh, that mirrors the reality. You may like uh, what you see there, you may not like what you see there. And to some extent, to a great extent, people come to these uh, poetry e events uh, just to compare what they are uh, uh, going to hear with the experience they have. Uh, you are saying that uh, it's not typical for any other country. Well, I don't think that's uh, that uh, speaks good for other countries where it is missing because I believe that poetry today in today's world is uh, unjustly marginalized. It's wrong because we um, raise uh, the society, we get education uh, in the world of uh, poetic literacy. We learn uh, poems by heart. We, we know um, classical poems. So poetry is always there. But then as soon as we uh, become adults, so we hear, okay, poetry is something that is not modern, that's something of the last uh, century. There is a demand for rhythm. There is a uh, uh, demand for uh, um, coherent sounds, the, the demand to fill the language, because poetry require really intense work. And it's not so much about content, that's the process more. It's like jogging. The idea of jogging is not to get to the destination. The idea of jogging is just the, the movement, the process, that's life, that's rhythm. And uh, if you love poetry, that's basically uh, working on your intellect intellectual muscles and building them up. And very often we forget about that when we look for senses and content about the and in the poetry. But uh, poetry is a sense just to, because of the rhythm it has about it. And I'm sure that uh, the potential and uh, uh, possibilities uh, linked to it, whether that's uh, audience or media outlets that could cover it uh, uh, is huge because at the moment it's, it's used only by 1.5 percent. If it if you had a poetic interview, what would it be? Uh, we do have it. We, ha we have a hip hop type of battles. Thus, people inside this literary 
milieu, we have quite limited in the understanding of poetry. Poetry is developing in its own ways. Hip hop, slams, street poetry, that's also poetry. Well, it is poetry. These are some new mainstream lines that we may not see. That's our problem, not the problem of poetry. Thank you. You have some experience. You've had a conversation in craft with your Andrew Kovic. What kind of experience was it? I think it was my 125th interview with your Andrew Hovic. I love him very much. In fact, my very first, the very first time I interviewed him was in 1997, 98, when he came to Kharkiv and then I asked him some questions. But this time he interviewed. Well, you need to ask him. Well, I see that he has that he was very well prepared, he had some questions he had written down, and in fact, he had a very serious attitude to that. You know, for me, why this conversation is uh, easy, not because I'm superficial or because I already have a lot of experience. Tanya Terren, I think, said it today that she's not a professional journalist. Somebody said it, that one is not a professional journalist. Nina Karno said that, right. I'm not a professional journalist either, and I don't want to be one. And I don't think that what I'm doing is, is journalism. That's just conversations. It's a possibility to speak and to listen. And I understand that from the point of view of professional journalists, professional reporting, professional art of interviews, there can be a lot of criticism of my conversations. And I'm aware of that. Moreover, and I want to correct that. I understand that uh, I feel comfortable. I'm interested. It's important for me to do these interviews in that way, like an amateur, uh, with account of all possible, you know, bias and subjective approach. It's important for me that these interviews would not be done according to some genre requirements but so it would be a dialogue a conversation it would be interesting for me as a person who starts this conversation and hopefully for the person who answers my questions and when you have this mutual respect and interest even if this interview is not too professional in terms of some canonical forms even if there is not much information but it has emotions it's more important for me and it satisfies me more so when i talk to yuri I would ask him the things that are interesting for me, what I would like to hear from him. I didn't try to, you know, bow to him, to be adapted to him. But at the same time, I, I tried to ask him some questions that perhaps uh, uh, I did not try to ask him questions that he would not like. I'm a kind of interviewer that when, like Andre has said, that when you are waiting for tea and they bring you coffee, when I bring them double coffee and tea as well, what kind of question would you like to be asked? But nobody has ever asked you that question, not even Andruhovic. Well, I can tell you, but you shouldn't think that I am uh, playing here. I really hate to be interviewed. Well, I'm trying to be honest with you. First of all, I believe I'm not a very interesting uh, person to talk to. All the things I could have said, I have said them many times. Usually the interviews with me is the things I repeat, repeat, and again, which probably means that I do not have very much profound experience in my life and it is not growing, you know, for every new interview. And it's probably not very good, you know, in terms of our interviewers who would not read my previous interviews and ask the same things of every time. Katya, I think, said here that uh, the Ukrainian literature is related to politics, that there is this kind of a relations with politics and uh, there are explanations there are reasons for it but on the other hand those reasons are not very convincing very often literature and art and culture in ukraine are drawn out of the, a natural area where they exist and drawn out to the area of politics where it doesn't look convincing well i primarily mean the interviews 
with myself when I have to comment the latest decisions of the National Security and Defense Council or how President Zelensky's ratings go down or where I have to comment, you know, the prices for oil instead of talking about poetry. Thank you very much. You said that you're not an interesting person. We do not agree with you. We were very happy to talk to you today. Well, you know, you're... Uh, our audience has questions. I'm giving the floor over to Darian. We have quite a lot of questions. But if we want to continue, let's start with Tatiana. From a professional point of view, do you have any questions to Serhi Jadan as an interviewer? As the interviewer, well, I can have the first question to him, like the question to an interviewer. I have known Sergei for quite some time and I have recorded him for the requisites project for the first volume. And he correctly said that he is quite a complicated character, not only because he has uh, spoken about certain things many times, but there are some areas into which he wouldn't let others get insight easily. My question to Sergei is whether he would one day agree to a book interview, to a very long conversation, and what he thinks about when this can happen. It's my question to him as to an interviewer. Tanya, thank you very much. This is one of those questions that I find difficult. Oh, here it is. Well, I can tell you, never, never, I would never agree to it. No, it's not interesting, really. Well, they often propose it to me to, you know, record, to talk for a book, like of a format, for example, the same format that you had with Taras Prohasco, I get. I could imagine this book, and I understand that I would be the first one who would not want to read this book. No, 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 no. Well, I, I wouldn't find it interesting. With all due respect, and I respect the genre and this work and the work you do. I have all your books, incidentally, and I read them. They're not just shelved, all those volumes and the book with Taras and Taras's books that he made, you know, as he recorded his own interviews. It's a fantastic series. I have them that. And probably because I have read all that, I don't really have a desire to do this book for you with you. Well, I understand how it would look like, how it will be read. And uh, this is not any kind of a claim toward the genre or any skepticism in terms of possible interviewers, but I'm skeptical and critical about what I could say, you know, for 300 pages of text. Well, I think that we have now given an answer to many publishers and many journalists who are still thinking about such a book. But there was a question to Serhi as an interviewer. I am a reader and a listener of Serhi's interviews, and I have talked about him mostly as a radio interviewer. But I remember his conversations published in the Sean magazine. If I remember, there were interviews for Esquire. Serhi used to do interviews, text interviews before. What is interesting for me is to ask you whether this radio genre is so different. What makes it so special for you compared to the other conversation that you did in another format? It's a very different approach because the interviews that are done, especially so that they would be decoded later, are very different because this is a kind of a text hanging in the air. While radio format is primarily based on the voice and intonations, it's a completely different approach and philosophy, and it's closer to me. Because Andre is here. I remember I once interviewed Andre for Shaw magazine, and uh, we recorded it. We recorded it at the NV radio. It's much more interesting for me in the radio, and I think the quality is much better. So to get back, Tanya, to your experience, well, I believe maybe based on my conversations, and I've had uh, a lot of them, you know, after a year of working at the radio, to do a book. Uh, for those people who would not listen to the radio, who are more interested in reading text. So maybe I can think about such a book. 
I will allow myself to clarify just one thing, because we're talking about some specific skills and approaches. One of the most uh, difficult rules uh, about interviews, one of the most difficult things one has to learn is the art of uh, interrupting and talking about radio TV interviews. That's one of the biggest challenges. When I listen to Havori Jadan radio show, when he comes guests who talk for a long time, I always get nervous. I understand that uh, so he has this timeline where there should be some music or advertisements and one has to inter you, he has to interrupt this person. Did you learn to interrupt your guests so working on radio? No, I did not. I have not learned it yet. Every time it becomes very difficult for me and I do that with a lot of heartache. Well, I would like to use my possibility and interrupt you. No, I'm not used to interrupting people. And then you understand that in fact, Sometimes you interrupt a person for quite uh, at the time, which is not very good for an interview when people start talking. But it's the problem of the format, this radio format that we have. Well, it is really structured in times of timeline. And you every seven minutes, you have to interrupt your vis-a-vis. -vis. Well, of course, I would uh, warn them before that, tell them, dear friends, I would have to interrupt you, but it's not good for our conversation. Besides, you know what makes it difficult there? The conversation lasts for 56 minutes. And starting with the 35th minute, most guests finally start talking. And as soon as they start talking, you need to wind it up. It would be better to have an hour and a half or two hours because the more you go, the better it becomes. You know, the person becomes relaxed. It starts feeling oneself. It stops looking at you as a journalist, as a person who is doing that for the radio, but just as a person who has a conversation with them. I've had another kind of experience that I didn't like. Andre knows it. We had a project called 30 Stories of Independent Ukraine. And there we had guests... Uh, uh, where the conversations lasted for 30 minutes. That's about nothing. You just say hello, you introduce a person, you ask them how are they, and the moment they start telling you about how they are, you tell them goodbye. The last question we will let you go. Why do you want to would like to have text versions of your radio interviews? When we see YouTube and video format that everyone loves and you love radio format, why would you still want to publish your conversations? Well, first of all, I'm an outdated person coming from the previous millennium. I'm used to paper books. I'm used to putting all of my experience on paper. That's number one. Second, and the second thing comes out of the first thing. A part of those conversations I have recorded are deserved being documented. And primarily thanks to my guests who have said some important things. I would like that to be somehow reflected, you know, to stay on as books. And let's be frank, in spite of the fact that YouTube, YouTube is popular, we still have people who still stubbornly read books. And I think we have to meet such people halfway. Thank you, manuscripts do not Burn. And a question to Andre, probably now. Now, the genre of interview, can it help us to promote Ukraine abroad? What kind of Ukrainians are interesting for Americans? Well, talking about, it's a question from Tetyana. Well, talking about the representatives of Ukrainian culture, who was very successful, Dahabraha band, uh, as they toured. The United States was very successful. I know that the girls, the musicians of the band, they were interviewed a lot. But of course, people, well, they, it would be mostly interesting for the Ukrainian diaspora, but there were some Americans as well who were very enthusiastic about their music. And of course, the popular genres are easier for the general audience to grasp. If a Ukrainian movie gets to the general U.S. screens, then clearly the interviews with the film director and the main actors who play the main characters 
will definitely be able to add a lot to the popularity of the movie and the country. Thank you. And a question to Katya, the last question for today. How do you get funding for the projects of craft? Is it public funding? How do you raise money? The answer would be very short. Well, there are some grants, uh, naturally, there is some kind of support uh, from public grants. Uh, uh, honestly speaking, we didn't get down to this issue seriously. The first six months we were focused on production and we didn't give a thought to further funding because we faced the choice whether to work on the materials on the content or where I raise money and uh, the latter is a different uh, science and it takes a lot uh, um, of uh, time and uh, we uh, are working on the craft uh, and uh, that's not our main activity so that's our own money that's uh, the support uh, of people who work with us that's uh, uh, photographers uh, a video, a video experts, and uh, well, they do get uh, paid, but it's really a, a, smi a, a small one. That's the journalists and authors that uh, joined the team, and uh, um, some of them are ready to work uh, free of charge. So, well, anyways, we, we do offer some pay. We have uh, some advertising, it could be one of the sources of uh, uh, funding, but uh, then we'll uh, need to look uh, around further and uh, look for the uh, funding to produce more materials. That was the last question to our guest. Thank you very much, uh, Katya. Thanks to all our guests. Uh, it seems to be we had in-depth uh, discussion, in-depth uh, conversation about culture. I learned a lot of new scenes for myself. Thank you very much for your mission. Thank you for supporting Ukrainian culture. Let me thank the audience. Let me thank for the interesting questions. Enjoy the night and see you soon.